All right. We are going to talk about populism and the election of 1896 today. Um, as far as y'all's tests goes, I have not graded them all yet because I haven't gotten them from all the campuses yet. So uh, I don't know. If, I don't remember which campus hasn't sent, but one of the campuses has not sent their uh, their exams to me yet. So. Um, I will have them up by the end of the week anyway, great. It's, it's probably going to take me till Friday to get them all done. Okay. Um, populism. Populism is just the belief that the ultimate power is the power of the people. And a populist will always try and appeal directly to the voters in a very uh, uh, simple manner. They'll try and appeal to the lowest common denominator voter. They're, they tend to, tend to appeal on pocketbook issues. They tend to appeal on issues of big government solutions, quick solutions to big problems. And what we're going to see in this lecture is the growth of populism, and we're going to watch it culminate in the election of 1896. So. Farmers were facing a great deal of problems in the Gilded Age. Um, they had declining prices for their, for their goods. They also had increasing uh, uh, expenses to ship them. Because what was happening was the railroads were charging exorbitant rates. You also had droughts happening. That was wiping out some of the, some of the uh, the crops, and you had all that new technology that was making some of these farmers' jobs redundant. All of this was happening at one time, and that's going to lead the farmers into what we call a populist revolt. Right here at the end of the Gilded Age, they're going to look for a a savior to come through and and, and save them. The biggest issue to farmers was the silver issue. Now, once upon a time, our money, we discussed this before, but our money was backed by gold and silver. It was called bimetallism, okay? But in what we call the crime of 73, in 1873, we had demonetized silver. What that means is the government had stopped coining silver directly. Our money was now backed strictly by, strictly on the gold standard. Um, this puts less money in circulation. And at least in the minds of farmers, it means that with less money in circulation, there's less money for the far farmers, less money for everybody. It's kind of a third grade understanding of economics. Um, the idea that that uh, more, more currency means more money, okay? It doesn't really. What happens when you have less currency is the currency you have becomes more valuable. It's, it, it's a scarcity situation. What gives something its value is scarcity. So if you print lots of money, that money is worth less, less. If you only print a little money, there may not be much out there, but every little bit's worth more. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, in 1878, the Bland Allison Act is passed. Uh, what this does is it limits the silver ratio to 16 to 1. So, what that means is uh, it just limited the amount of silver that the government could, could, could put into circulation. Uh, this is a kind of big deal. This was actually a smart move. By limiting the amount of precious metals in circulation, you're actually increasing the value of your money. Um, but again, people didn't understand that. They just saw this as less money in circulation. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 said that, uh, that the U.S. Treasury, it set, a, it set an amount of money that the U.S. Treasury must spend on silver each month. Well, but this money was, was, was bought up by the Treasury and deposited rather than put into circulation. So what that does is it, it takes that money off the market and it drives silver prices up. 
again, it's a situation of cutting back the amount of available funds. Uh, it's not really taking money from farmers, but it feels like it is, okay? Because there's less silver on the open market. So the silver issue is going to be pretty important. And it's going to lead the farmers to revolt against the United States. We really have our first agrarian revolt at this time period. Uh, agrarian is just an old word for farmers. It's where we get our word agriculture from, okay? They come from the same, the, the same word, uh, agris. So the agrarian revolt is a revolt of farmers. Now, it's not an armed revolt. What it's going to be is a bunch of farmers that decide to organize themselves into political organizations. If you look at this, this price index for farm products from 1865 to 1913, you can see what happens. Any place you see blue is where farmers are receiving prices that are, that are good, that are better than, the, than what they pay for the purchase. They're selling for something for more than it, than it uh, costs them to make. Anytime you see red, it's a time when farmers are paying more for their purchase than they can then sell, sell their goods for. So that's dividends, I'm sorry, that's deficit spending. And if you look at this, the time period that we're in, right in here, we are sliding out of this blue and into this red area, okay? And we're going to stay in that area all the way up till the, uh, till almost the roaring 20s, okay? This is not a good time to be a farmer in America. Farmers are losing money left and right, and they want to find an enemy. They want to, they need a boogeyman, something to, to point at. And what they point at are big businesses and capitalism. And they're going to attack both of those things, capitalism and big business. America kind of has a bit of a socialist uh, experiment here. We call this the Grange. The Grange was first organized right here uh, in the South. It spreads in, I'm sorry, in Texas. It spreads up into the Midwest and the South. But it's a group of cooperative associations of farmers where farmers organize themselves into co-ops to, uh, to, to try and sell their products at higher prices. So this is what happens. All the farmers organize into what's essentially a political union. And they agree to set a bottom price for their product, that nobody will sell their product for less than whatever this price is. And what that does is it artificially inflates the prices. Well, farmers make a little bit more money. But here's the deal. If farm products are artificially inflated, everybody has to pay for, the, pay for food. So everybody pays artificially high prices. And then to pay for that, they're going to inflate their own prices to cover it. So wages became more expensive. Uh, the cost to ship things became more expensive. Uh, this Granger movement sounded like a good movement on the surface. We still have these. You see farmers co-ops all the time. Uh, if you ever go to the farmers, farmer's market, it's probably a co-op, and they set prices. They say you can't charge less than such and such money for, for, for a good. Uh, they even went through and started lobbying Congress for what they call Granger Laws. What Granger Laws were mostly was laws limiting how much money railroads could charge for cargo. Um, railroads were doing some, something called weird, called uh, long haul versus short haul pricing, where they were actually charging you more money per mile to ship something on a short haul, a short distance, than they did to ship it a long distance all the way across the country. Uh, so the further away you ship something, the cheaper it was, uh, your, your freight wage, wages were. Uh, that kind of makes sense because it creates less, less stopping time for the railroads. It's kind of something that, 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 that works for railroads. But it was deemed to be a restraint of trade. It was deemed to be a violation of the Sherman Laws. And, uh, and the Granger Laws ultimately don't succeed. By the 1870s, the Grange movement is collapsing, but it's gonna be replaced by another movement that we'll, we'll talk about in a little while. Let's talk about two big Supreme Court cases 
I have seen the top one, Munn versus Illinois, on the star test before. I have never seen the Wabash case show up on the, on the star test, but it could. It is on your, uh, your EOC requirements to know about. So you need to know these. The Munn case. What happens here is grain storage facilities along the railroads were charging extremely high rates. And states started coming in and forcing them, regulating them, forcing them to lower their rates. The states would argue that your exorbitant rates to, uh, to, to, to store this grain for farmers is is criminal that you're you're in a monopoly situation the farmers have to use your product because there's no other way to do it and you're using using that force to to charge criminally high high amounts of money well in this case they sued claiming that we're a private industry and the government has no right to enforce uh to regulate us. they have no right to tell us how much we could charge. Well, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court and Chief Justice Morrison Rimmick White comes up and he says that the state power to regulate private industries is okay as long as those private industries affect public interest. So because the, uh, the grain silos, the grain storage facilities affected the cost of grain, which was an essential product the survival of the public, the state government had the right to go in and, uh, and regulate it and force them to lower their prices. Uh, the Wabash case is going to be related to that here in just a second. But the Munn case is, has got a long-term uh, uh, effect on us. Still today, this is why we have cases where, uh, where the state government and the federal government can regulate things like uh, taxi services, Uber drivers, uh, railroads, trains, planes, anything like that the public uses and has been deemed a necessary product can be regulated by the federal government because of the Munn case. Uh, Wabash versus St. Louis and Pacific Railroad Company uh, versus Illinois. This was a case where Illinois was trying to regulate the railroads inside its, uh, its, its state borders. They were trying to set prices on railroads inside their, their, their borders. Well, they sued and they went to the court and the Wabash case does something a little different. They actually don't side on the side of the states like the Munn case did. The Wabash case goes a step forward and they say because railroads have trade between states, interstate, because they go from one state to another. They cannot be regulated by the state. They can only be regulated by the federal government. And the reason they say that is because the Constitution gives the federal government the authority to regulate interstate commerce. Um, if interstate and intrastate confuses you, interstate means more than one state. Intrust state means inside the borders of a state. Okay, think of an interstate highway goes between states. Okay, uh, if, if that helps you out. So that's the Wabash case. Again, I've never seen the Wabash case come up on a test, but I have seen the Munn case show up uh, on more than one occasion. So at least have a basic understanding of these two. Uh, nothing super complicated. All right, so when the Grange collapses, it's going to be replaced by a purely political organization called the Farmers Alliance. Again, starts in Texas uh, and, and moves out. So the Farmers Alliance, you end up with, with these rival groups. You have the Texas Alliance, the Southern Alliance, the Northern Alliance. All of these groups of farmers that, that, that kind of came under this umbrella of the Farmers Alliance. This is going to be built upon what's left over uh, after the Grange collapses. It is a lot more political and a lot less social than the Grange. The Grange was almost like a uh, like a club. It was uh, you know the Grange had 
had meeting houses and they would meet monthly and have dances and stuff. This guy, these guys don't do that. They're not interested in being a social organization at all. These guys strictly want to win elections. They run candidates for office all over the country with Granger laws as their, uh, as their goal. And they were very successful. While the Farmers Alliance never wins a presidency, it does control eight state legislatures. That means in eight states, more than, uh, more than half, more than 50% of the legislatures came out of the Farmers Alliance. Uh, several of those had governors. And they had 47 representatives in Congress. That's not bad. That's about, that's about oh, between 20 and 25% of Congress was a member of the Farmers Alliance. Uh, now, I don't want you to think of it as a political party. While it sometimes could be and people could run as a member of that party, more often than not, they were Democrats running with the support of the Farmers Alliance or Republicans running with the support of the Farmers Alliance, okay? Um, it's a little, bit, a little bit different than a political party, but still it's that group of farmers that they're trying to get to. So the Northern and Southern Alliance are going to merge into this Farmers Alliance. I love this, uh, this cartoon or propaganda piece up here. Uh, if you look at it, it's all these different union members, and they're all coming together, united we stand, divided we fall, by pulling all of these farmers together under one umbrella organization, they became a real power, something that could, uh, that could sway whole elections. I need to get rid of this uh, animation on here, it takes too long. All right. The Farmers Alliance is going to be limited in scope, though, because, well, it's a farmers organization, right? And if you want to expand beyond that, you really need, uh, need to get, get further than that. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a new umbrella organization called the Populist Party or the People's Party. Remember, populist just means people, okay? Think about when you're popular in school, it means the people like you. If you've got the population of a town, it's the count of the people. Popular means people, okay? So the People's Party or the Populist Party. In 1890, the Southern Alliance was trying to gain control of the Democratic Party, Democratic Party, while the Northern Alliance was running their own separate candidates. Uh, that's always gonna be a problem. So what happens in 1892, 800 delegates from these two organizations all meet in St. Louis, Missouri. A hundred of these members were black Americans, African Americans. So this is a very forward thinking organization. Remember by this time the blacks had to vote, so this is kind of a big deal. It is made up of the remnants of all of these small organizations that had failed in the past. Uh, it's got members of the Grains. It's got members of the Farmers Alliance. It's got old members of the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. They're all coming together uh, under this one big umbrella. And they form, they form this brand new party. Um, this is really the first true third party in American history. A party that really stood a chance of winning elections. Uh, the popular party is going to have some, some real celebrities in it. I go too fast, y'all tell me. Here's an editorial cartoon. I've included it for you because I saw it on the star test one time years ago. I think it's a kind of impressive cartoon. If you look at it, it says uh, the People's Party, and they're in a hot air balloon that is called the Platform of Lunacy. And if you look at their balloon, it's patched together with a bunch of parts. You can see the old Granger Party, the Knights of Labor, the Greenback, the Farmers Alliance, the Prohibition, the Socialists, uh, Anarchists, the Free Silver, the Communists. They're all pulled together. This is a patchwork party. 
And as a result, these, these guys aren't going to agree on a lot of stuff. So the party is going to always kind of be just a little bit lost in what its goals are. At different times, different parts of this are going to be, uh, be in charge. They are able to win several congressional seats. This was their presidential candidate. James B. Weaver and James Field was their vice presidential candidate. They are nominated in an open convention in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892. Receive almost a million popular votes. That's not nearly enough to win the presidency, but that's a million votes. That's a lot of votes. Um, and they did win several congressional seats. So they're going to be a legitimate party. Man, I miss the old days when our presidents had beards like that. We're not going to elect a president with a beard anymore. Nobody trusts guys with beards, man. Weird. Y'all got it? So what is their platform going to be? I've discovered over the years that a lot of students don't know that word platform. Uh, platform is the system of beliefs that a party has. It's what they're trying to get accomplished. The way I tell my students to remember it is the platform is what you stand on. It's your beliefs that you stand on. Okay? Think if you stand on a platform, well, you stand on your beliefs. Your, uh, that's what holds you up. This is what they want to do. See if it sounds a little crazy at times, uh, and, and, and maybe it does. Number one, a system of sub-treasuries. What they were afraid of was they were afraid of having one bank that collapses and, uh, and fails for everybody. So instead of having one national bank, they wanted a series of sub-treasuries all around the country where the U.S. money was kind of spread out. So if one of those sub-treasuries is mismanaged and fails, all the money's not gone. That doesn't sound like a bad idea. Uh, by the way, that's pretty similar to what we ended up with with the Fed later on. But in 1892, that sounds crazy. Well, if you're gonna have sub-treasuries, you certainly don't need a national bank. So they wanna abolish the national bank. Third, they, want the, they wanted the direct election of US senators. This seems silly to us today because it's exactly what we have. Why wouldn't you do this? We, we look at it and we go, we directly elect our senators today. But that's not the way it was supposed to be done. And if you ask me and if you ask a lot of political scientists or historians, they'll tell you this is the biggest crime the U.S. ever did was we, we passed this bill. This part of their platform got passed. The 17th Amendment is what does it during, during Woodrow Wilson. It went through and it said that our senators would be directly elected by the people. It's not how it was supposed to be. In our original constitution, our congressman, the House of Representatives, was the voice of the people, and it was elected by the people. Our senators were supposed to be the voice of the state, and they were supposed to be elected by the state legislatures in each state. Well. At this time, people are going, no, we want the people to have all the power. Remember, populist party, people's party. We want all the power to be in the hands of the people. So they start calling for the direct election of senators. They didn't get it immediately, but we're going to see that under Woodrow Wilson in the early uh, part of the 20th century, it's going to pass. We're going to get the 17th Amendment passed. So I'm looking so far, and we, they've kind of gotten all these. We still got a national bank, but we do have the sub-treasuries too. Uh, fourth one, this is where I get a little scared at their beliefs. Government ownership of all railroads, telephone, and telegraph companies. Here was their logic. Your railroads, your telephones, and your telegraphs are essential needs of the people. We can't have run a business without these three things. And because of that, they should not be existing for purposes of making a profit. 
They should be existing to help the average American. And if we just made them government owned and taxpayer funded, then we could use the railroads cheaper. We could use uh, telegraphs cheaper. It would help everybody. Everybody would have an equal shot at it instead of just the rich being able to use it. We have a name for this, it's called socialism. These guys were socialists for all practical purposes, okay? Now they weren't using that word just yet, they're going to, but uh, that's a very socialist idea. Five, government operated postal savings banks. Uh, a postal savings bank is kind of a strange concept. It's, uh, it, it's a way that you could get, uh, kind of like buying savings bonds, but you'd be buying, you'd be buying stamps. Uh, restriction of undesirable immigration. That sounds familiar. We're right in the middle of a nativist period right now in our history. Well, they were nativists then too. They did not want what they called undesirable immigration. What they didn't want was competition for their jobs. They didn't want us bringing in uneducated physical labor, particularly Chinese uneducated physical labor because uh, they would work for cheaper than the average American would. And Americans didn't want that kind of competition. We still hear that today, guys. We still hear, you gotta stop immigration. They're coming for our jobs, okay? Uh, an eight hour work day for all government employees. Most people worked 12 to 15 hours back then. They wanted to lower it to eight hours. Now this is just for government employees, but still, that sounds reasonable. The abolition of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Remember the Pinkertons? We talked about them during the labor unrest. They were the guys, the, the bully boys that got called out to break up the railroad strikes and stuff. And they would break them up with chains and, and baseball bats and stuff. The Pinkerton Detective Agencies were hired, uh, hired muscle. They wanted the Australian secret ballot. That's a great idea. I like that. That's what we're used to doing now, where you get to vote in secret. That's not how we used to do it. In fact, uh, up to this time, whenever you showed up somewhere to vote, on election day, you'd go to your polling place and they go, everybody that votes for Bob, raise your hand. And you would, they just write, just write it down. The problem with that is, what happens if, you're, uh, if your boss doesn't like how you voted? And he can sit there and see how you voted. He can now punish you for it. It was a way to put pressure on you. So they want to get rid of that. And the tenth one was the remonetization of silver. Uh, again, they're still blaming the demonetization of silver for the economic collapse, uh, which is, is pretty ridiculous. So when I look at this, I go, you know, some of these ideas are reasonable. Some of these ideas are scary as crap. Okay? And I see an America that could really easily have gone socialist at this time. Uh, the last one, I, I missed that as a single term for president and vice president. They wanted the president and vice president to only be allowed to serve one term. No re-election. That's interesting. I put this cartoon up here. This is from, uh, this is from the platform where they were literally advertising that if we lived in, in, in this populous world that we wanted to, the United States Railway and Telegraph Office would all be owned by the U.S. government. Everybody would be happy. You'd get mileage tickets. you get so, much, uh, uh, so many tickets a, a month or a year, and you were free to use them however you wanted to. Uh, everything would be free. Uh, well, free because you're paying taxes to support it instead. So in the 1892 election, this is how it turns out. The Democrat, Grover Cleveland, wins all of those, I don't know, peak, peach, whatever color that is, states. Uh, Benjamin Harrison wins the blue states. And Weaver pretty much wins the West. Uh, Weaver was the populist candidate. Now Weaver doesn't get anywhere near enough votes to win the presidency. Grover Cleveland wins it pretty easily. But if you see how many votes Weaver got out west, and you realize those are the states that are growing the quickest. Weaver put the fear of God in them, okay? They were terrified of what was coming.
What was the big issue? Again, the big issue is bimetallism. Should it, should it be gold? Should, should, or should we, our money be backed by gold? Should it be backed by silver? Or should it be backed by both? That's going to keep coming up. We're going to ultimately go with gold. We kind of already talked about the Panic of 1893 in a previous lecture, but we got to get back to this, uh, this election and see why it happened. But a panic is a severe economic downturn. Um, usually it's called by, caused by over-speculation. This happens 10 days after Grover Cleveland takes office. Um, and it is over-speculation. Our businesses were spending money they didn't have. They were investing money and gambling that their investment would turn a profit before they had to pay their debts. And when it didn't, they desperately created a sell-off. Uh, several major corporations went bankrupt. Over 16,000 businesses closed up, closed doors, shuttered, and disappeared during this time period. Uh, people didn't have jobs, so what do they do? Well, they need to close their savings out, so they sold their stocks off. And when you sell your stocks off all at once, it triggers a stock market crash. And you just have this domino effect of, you know, I lost my job, so I'm going to sell my stock. Well, I sell my stock. Now the company that I own the stock in can't pay their bills, so they have to sell their stock. And they have to lay people off. And then those people got laid off, and they have to sell their stock in order to, uh, to make a living. And pretty soon... All the stock has been devalued until there's nothing left. Uh, bank failures are all over the country. Over 500 banks closed, or, or about 500 banks closed at this time period. And this creates what we call a credit crunch, or a credit contraction. The banks did not have enough money to loan money. And here's the deal, if banks stop loaning money, then businesses can't operate because a lot of businesses operate month to month and they they know what, when their money's coming in. They're, I've got money coming in at the end of the month, but I've got to pay my bills now. So they would borrow money to get them through the month. At the end of the month, they would pay off their debt and then put a little profit back. And this is how a lot of businesses operate still today. Well, when 500 banks close, there's a whole lot less money out there to, uh, to invest. And this contraction means business can't, business can't get those small loans to cover themselves to operate from month to month. And it causes those business to fall, to fail. By 1895, there's about 3 million unemployed people in America. And Americans are crying out for relief. We need something. And what they want, largely, is socialism. They want the government to give them money give them a, a, a immediate financial help. Now, they're not yet to communism. They don't want permanent help. They want somebody, the government to give them assistance right now. But the government continues its laissez-faire policies and stays out of it. Here is a, an editorial cartoon. Again, I've seen this on the star test before. Uh, it's called The Road to Pauperism. And if you look at it, You've got labor, that guy stands for the worker in America. He's carrying debt on his back and he's walking down the road and he sees that prosperity has died. There's a, uh, a, a uh, tombstone there for prosperity. You see it says, uh, enslaved in 1863, stabbed in the back in 73 and assassinated in 93. Those are all times when the government passed laws that the populism were against. The populists weren't against. Those are all Silver Act laws. Uh, so they're blaming bad government legislation for their, uh, their, their economic condition. At the end of the 19th century, a farmer wrote this. When the banker says he's broke and the merchants up in smoke, they forget that it's the farmer that feeds them all. It would put them to the test if the farmer took a rest, then they know that it's the farmer feeds them all. What he's saying here is, 
You're letting your farmers die. You're letting your farmers suffer when it's the farmer that is taking care of everyone. Uh, and this is kind of the, the, the mentality of the time period. 1894, Jacob Coxey leads an army of people to, to uh, Washington, D.C. Now, I'm using the word army pretty loosely. Uh, a lot of these guys are veterans, but they're actually just a bunch of uh, largely unemployed homeless people. And what they're doing is they're marching on D.C. and demanding assistance. We just called it Coxey's Army. But he called it Coxey's Army of the Commonwealth of Christ. Okay? And they're demanding that they get a check and they be helped taken care of by the government. Basically what they're demanding is an unemploy unemployment insurance in a time period when that didn't exist. Uh, Coxey's Army is forced out of D.C. literally at gunpoint at times. Uh, they also come in with fire hoses and spray them down. Uh, these Hayseed socialists, as they called them, were forced out of D.C. So, what's the result of the election returns going to be? We saw the results. If you look at this, populist victories, Indiana, Illinois, Chicago, uh, Colorado, all these states, particularly the western states, are falling to populism. And it is going to kill the modern Democratic Party for a while. Populist vote increased by 40% in 1894. Uh, Democratic losses in the West were catastrophic. And the Republicans got control of both houses of Congress. We have a presidential election coming up. The Republicans are now in charge of the, the court and both houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate. And it's the populists that cost the Democrats elections. That takes us to the 1896 election. And again, the big deal is going to be bimetallism. William Jennings Bryan used these as his, uh, as his campaign buttons. They're gold and silver bugs. Uh, again, that's, that's William McKinley. I'm, I'm sorry, it's William Jennings Bryan up there in the picture. And these guys were they, they were pushing for bimetallism. Kind of cool campaign uh, uh, swag. William Jennings Bryan, the great commoner, a uh, guy that we call the orator of the plat. We've talked about him before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about him. But uh, he was known as a fire and brimstone kind of, uh, of, of speaker. He traveled around the country on a on a uh, train track giving these great great speeches that's him there uh, this is one of the things the, the the songs that people would sing uh, again that was a big thing back then was they would have campaign songs prairie avenger mountain lion brian 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 gigantic troubadour speaking like a siege gun smashing plymouth rock with his boulder boulders from the west the idea that this guy could come through here and sweep the nation with his populist bent. And people legitimately thought that William Jennings Bryan was going to win this election. Uh, he doesn't, but he does do quite well at it. This is one of the famous cartoons. We've seen it before, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But he gives his cross of gold speech. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. He's painting, using biblical imagery to paint this question of the, of the bimetallism issue as a question of Christianity. Uh, he's arguing for bimetallism. I love that cartoon. I think it's pretty awesome uh, as Brian holding the crown of thorns while holding the, the, the cross that he will be crucified on. Uh, how did he do this? This was a weird campaign. William Jennings Bryan 
runs a whistle stop campaign. This is something that we hadn't really seen before. He got on the back of trains and he traveled from town to town and set the back up for a place to speak. And he would stop at every town and people would gather around and he would give these speeches. 18,000 miles worth of campaign stops off the back of the train. People all over the country legitimately saw Brian because he would stop in every little podunk town and give a speech. Whether there was five people there or 500 people there, he gave a speech. And it looked like he was getting momentum. While he was having this very active campaign, his rival, a guy named William McKinley, was choosing to run what we call the uh, front porch campaign, where he stayed, uh, he kind of stayed at home and pretended like he didn't want to be president. The, uh, the Democratic Party is going to kind of collapse because they're going to be taken over by the loony left, the agrarian left, these socialist farmers, these, uh, these people that, that uh, most people in the North can't possibly trust. Their platform is going to be a little crazy. Uh, they're going to want to reduce tariffs. That's a good thing. Gonna cut taxes on imported goods. But they wanted to have an income tax, a federal income tax. We didn't have an income tax back then. We're not going to have that until Woodrow Wilson. He screws that up for us too. He wanted to break up the trusts. He wanted the railroads. They wanted the railroads to be, be turned into government institutions, and they wanted free silver. So the last four of these, at least, are crazy, crazy ideas that are going to alienate the whole board. And you can see what people think about it. This is an editorial cartoon of the Republican Party crucifying labor. That's Mark Hanna that's putting the, uh, the crown of thorns on labor's head. And Rothschild, the banker, holding, uh, holding labor to the cross. So this guy, William McKinley, is going to be the savior of the day. Uh, McKinley's an interesting character. He, he largely becomes a presidential candidate because he was known for being a very good-looking, attractive man, and he looked presidential with that big uh, Roman nose of his. And, and that, you know, he just looking presidential was important at that time. Um, he also had been in the Civil War. Now, I'm not going to say he was a Civil War hero, but he did serve in the Civil War. And that gives him a little bit of credibility that others didn't have. Here's Mark Hanna on the left. He was a political uh, boss talking to uh, candidate William McKinley. And McKinley really wanted to stick to his guns and be right. But Hanna said, nope, we're going to say what's popular and we're going to get elected. And he points here. Behind him is a picture of Henry Clay. You remember Henry Clay from last, last semester. Ran for president four times, never won it. Uh, he's, Hannah says, that man Clay was an ass. It's better to be president than to be right. What he means by that is Henry Clay stuck to his guns and was right on everything. And he lost the presidency four times because of it. What you need to do is you need to say whatever has to be said to win the presidency. what does he do? Well, McKinley does what candidates have done for generations. He straddles the issue and refuses to answer questions. So much so that this was a suggestion for a McKinley political poster. That's William McKinley dressed as Napoleon straddling the silver and gold issue. Uh, it's supposed to be making fun of him. It's pretty effective, I think. Uh, by the way, this is Mark Hanna back here as a comet flying across. Uh, here is a more successful editorial cartoon. This is from Harper's Weekly, the biggest magazine at the time. It's called The Seasoned Politician versus the Young Newcomer. On the left is a picture of William McKinley, dressed in his union officer's uh, 
outfit. In 1861, William McKinley was upholding his country's honor, and he's doing it yet. And then on the right it says, in 1861, this is what William Jennings Bryan was doing. And he's doing it yet. So they're saying, William McKinley is standing up for his country while William, Mc, or, or, while William Bryan is a baby crying and moaning. Okay? Pretty effective. Pretty effective. There was also a group called the Prohibition Party. The Prohibition Party wanted to outlaw all alcohol. Uh, it's adopted eventually into the People's Party. And this is a cartoon for that time period. It says, into which box were the voters of 96 places ballot? Will you vote for the Republicans, which says they're the builders of corporate wealth? Will you vote for the People's Party, the builders of churches and schools? or the Democratic Party, the builders of saloons and jails? Well, I got the choice of saloons and jails, rich corporate businessmen, or I can build churches. I'm gonna build churches, okay? Again, a pretty effective, uh, pretty effective ad. Here's how it turns out. Not really all that surprising. William McKinley wins the blue states. Brian wins the red states. It looks at, at first glance like Brian should have won because he covers more of the area, but he doesn't get any of the big states. All the big population states go to McKinley. McKinley ends up winning with 51% of the popular votes and 61% of the electoral votes. William McKinley is now president of the United States. And he's kind of our first modern president. Uh, he'll be the first one that, that kind of seems familiar to us. Why did Brian lose? Well, he focused so much on farmers' issues that he couldn't make the, uh, he didn't make the supporters of urban issues very happy. Uh, he didn't farm any, form any alliances with urban voters. So he lost all the big cities. You can't become president just on the back of rural voters. You can come close. I mean, Bush, Bush does, a lot, does it in a lot of ways, and uh, Nixon did it in a lot of ways, but you, you, you gotta, you gotta carry some cities, and he didn't carry any. Uh, McKinley's campaign was also a really strange campaign, the front porch campaign. He literally sat on his front porch and had people, reporters come to him with radios and did radio shows from his porch and pretended like he didn't want to be president. He became president by saying, I don't want to be president. That seems weird to us, but Americans like a reluctant hero. We like a president that Seems like he doesn't want to be there, as weird as that is. Uh, McKinley's campaign was also highly funded with uh, uh, business money. Well, with the election of McKinley, gold wins. In 1900, we passed the Gold Standard Act. Uh, this is a definite uh, victory for the forces of conservatism and Silver is never going to rear its ugly head again in American history. I'm not going to go into the Wizard of Oz thing because we talked about it before, but we talked about how the Wizard of Oz was a parable about uh, the gold standard, uh, maybe. was really nothing but a parable of the idea that the gold standard was going to lead us to danger. William McKinley was the, uh, the, the wizard in this, the, 
the whole story is kind of a bizarre little story. We're not going to go over the whole thing, but each one of these uh, was a character in our story. If you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz, go watch it. Man, it's a pretty good story. Huh? I'd be, su be surprised how many people haven't seen it. It's a pretty good movie, though. Um, you ever read the, ori the original books? They're a whole lot darker than that, that movie was. All right, so populism is going to be massive in the West at this time period. You can just look at these numbers and you can see that the populist party is going to be victorious in all of these green states, okay? So this is going to scare the two major parties. And the two major parties are going to start adopting some of these populist ideas to keep them from, uh, from, from being successful. So what happens? The economy experiences a lot of change. People stop being farmers, and that's going to make the Farmers Alliance weaker. Um, the idea of these small-time